Okay, hello everybody. Uh, this is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Uh, welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Uh, tonight we're continuing the study of the book of John, and we're going to pick up where we left off last time, uh, chapter 6, verse 45. Uh, if you have not seen the previous studies um, from the beginning of, of the book of John, I hope you will go back and watch this from the beginning. Uh, those videos are available on my YouTube channel, Sin City Preacher. Uh, before we get into the study, let me ask uh, Brother Stephen to introduce himself. Hey, everybody. It's Stephen once again, you know, also known as Stephen Rivers TV here on YouTube. Looking forward to another night of fellowship, you know, studying God's Word and preaching the gospel, which I look forward to sharing with you in about 50 minutes or so. Okay. Thank you, brother. All right, without further ado, let's get right into the scriptures. Um, I'm a KJV firstist, so I will read it in the KJV first, but I will also compare it with the Amplified because the Amplified amplifies it. <laughs> so sometimes I find it helpful. All right. It is written in the prophets, and they shall be all taught of God. Every man, therefore, that hath heard and hath learned of the Father cometh unto me. Not that any man hath seen the Father, save which he is of God, he hath seen the Father. Well, let me stop and let's concentrate on verse 45. Uh, I'll read it in the Amplified here before you. I ask your opinion on it. Verse 45 in the Amplified said, It is written in the prophets, and they will all be taught of God. That's a quote. Everyone who has listened to and learned from the Father comes to me. All right, I think that makes it very clear. Brother, what's your comment on that? Well, I mean, a lot of prophets were very, you know, knowledgeable, you know, of God. Well, of course, they gave all the prophecies that actually, you know, led up to, you know, Jesus, you know, and obviously his coming. And of course, you know, you know, brother, you know, for, I mean, sorry, brother, what am I saying? Uh, verse 46, you know, it's talking about, you know, you know, that Jesus is the only one, you know, who has seen the Father because, you know, he is, you know, God in the flesh. He is the eternal God. And of course, I mean, the deity of Christ is also an extremely important, you know, thing to talk about. But I want to get your opinion on uh, verse 45 as of right now. Okay. The, uh, the thing that stands out to me there is in verse 45 is it says, it is written in the prophets. Uh, first of all, in the prophets, a lot of people think it's just it's referring to uh, 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 some individuals who are prophets in the past. But when it says in the prophets, it's really talking about this portion of the Bible here. Um, Jesus and, and, and in the scriptures, when they say uh, it was uh, recorded in the law and the prophets, that's just another name for the Bible before the New Testament. They referred to it as the Law and the Prophets. The Law were the first five books, and then the, the remaining books were called the Prophets. So Jesus is saying that in the Old Testament, in the, in the, in the writings, the scriptures that we have now, uh, he says, these things are written, and they shall all be taught of God. So in other words, if you go to the scriptures, to the Prophets, to the Old Testament, uh, you will be taught, you will learn about me, is what he's saying. And it says in verse 40, um, uh, the, the rest of it says, Every man therefore that hath, that hath heard and hath learned of the Father cometh unto me. I like how it's phrased in the Amplified. I think it really explains it. Uh, it says, uh, um, Everyone who has listened to and learned from the Father, which is the writings in the uh, in the book of the prophets, everyone who has listened to and learned from the Father comes to me. In other words, if you learn, <laughs> if you have actually learned from studying the, the scriptures, then you will come to me because you'll understand it's been talking about me. That's what he's been saying in this chapter. He's been referencing back to everything that's written. It's what's written about me, but... You don't believe the scriptures. You don't believe Moses. So otherwise, you would know it's talking about me. Um, before I go on, any further comments on that? Yeah, all right, there's my camera. Um, 
Yeah, it's pretty much what I was just saying. You know, just in a nutshell, you know, everything that was, you know, said in the Old Testament, or as, you know, as we were calling it, referring to here as the Law and the Prophets, everything was pointing to Jesus, you know, from the beginning. You know, even from, you know, the Exodus, from the creation, you know, and everything all points to, you know, Jesus and you know, the sacrifice that he's going to make for us. But that's about all the comment I have for now, but looking forward to the next verse. Well, yeah, while, while we're on that subject, though, I, I will plug again uh, the a playlist I put together. Matter of fact, I've been, I just finished sharing that playlist on Google Plus this last week, and it is uh, Old Testament Pictures and Shadows of Jesus' Blood Atonement. The title of it is, is uh, The Bloody Trail. And, and it's uh, starting with Genesis all the way through the the Old Testament, uh, all the things that referenced, uh, we're talking about this future Messiah who would uh, die for our sins and be raised from the dead. Uh, I hope you'll watch that series because you'll see that what Jesus is claiming here is that mu much has been written about him already, uh, prophecies. And if you would read those and study them, then you'd understand who he is. And he's the fulfillment of those prophecies. Let me go to the next verse. It says, um, uh, Not that any man hath seen the Father, save he which is of God. He hath seen the Father. Uh, well, there's another verse similar to that uh, that we talked about earlier in this chapter or some other chapter in John, uh, and it's making the same point. He says, No one hath uh, been to heaven except he who has come down from heaven. So in other words, Jesus is saying, no one's gone up to heaven, I'm the, uh, and, and I, I, but, but I've come down from heaven. That's a verse that a lot of people who believe in uh, uh, unconscious uh, state of the, the dead, um, or some people call that soul sleep, a lot of those people will use that verse to support that, that viewpoint, that uh, no one's actually gone up to heaven, and that, uh, except him who's come down from heaven, Jesus. Uh, maybe we'll do a study on that topic someday. I'll probably invite Brother uh, Evan Nephilim Free and Brother uh, Ted, um, uh, God's Truth Ministries, uh, because they they hold to that position. So they can help us. Uh, they can teach us, and so we can see that perspective. But this verse is similar to that in saying that uh, no one has seen the Father, except how is it phrased again? Um, uh, uh, not that any man hath seen the Father, save he which is of God, he hath seen the Father. Um, well, in the KJV, it's still pretty clear, but I think in the Amplified, it'll uh, clarify it even further. Verse 46 in the Amplified says, uh, not that anyone has seen the Father, except he who was with the Father uh, and, and who is from God, he alone has seen the Father. Now, what this kind of supports to me is Christophany rather than theophany. Are you familiar with the, those two terms and the, and the, the distinction between them? Uh, not really. Well, you, you know that in, uh, in Genesis uh, is the first time we get an example of this this uh, idea. Uh, it said God walked with Adam and Eve in the garden. And so it's giving us an anthropomorphic uh, uh, view, God walking. Now, if God is walking, we figure he must have feet. So we, we think that, well, this is an example of God manifest himself in the flesh in order to walk with Adam and Eve. Uh, there's many of these uh, throughout the scriptures uh, uh, when uh, Jacob wrestled with uh, the, the angel of the Lord. Uh, the angel of the Lord is another term for, uh, for these incarnations, these theophanies or Christophanies where God comes and, and appears as a man. Before the, the incarnation of Jesus Christ as uh, the baby born in the, in the from the virgin before that God manifests them in the flesh throughout the Bible many many times uh, Shadrach Meshach and Abednego 
in the fiery furnace. And then they looked in and said, look, there's a fourth one there. It looks like it's the son of God. Um, there's there, I could go on and on. I've done a playlist on the whole topic. Anyway, you can look at that if you want, but there's a question. Is it a theophany or is it a Christophany? A, a theophany, uh, people would think that it's God, it's the father manifesting himself. It's when it says God walked with Adam and Eve in the garden. A lot of people think that would be the father walking with them. But then, uh, then that would uh, disagree with this verse we've got right here, wouldn't it? Because Adam and Eve, Adam and Eve saw him, apparently, uh, walking in the garden. And uh, if that's the case, then then this verse here wouldn't be correct. It says, um, um, he, uh, he alone has seen the Father. It says, not that anyone has seen the Father except he who was with the Father, who is from God. He alone has seen the Father. So that verse is telling us that nobody has seen the Father except Jesus Christ himself. And if that's the case, then this example of God walking with Adam and Eve in the garden could not be a theophany, or, or a, if a person defines theophany as the Father. And that's why there's a distinction in, in between the word theophany and Christophany. Christophany means that this appearance is, is a, a pre-incarnation appearance of Jesus Christ. Um, so that to me, that's the only way of making that make sense. Rather, it could, couldn't be a theophany. As a matter of fact, I think this verse here refutes the entire concept of theophanies. It's never dawned on me before, but uh, I do got, think God has appeared to, uh, with man throughout the, throughout the Bible. He, uh, when uh, Abraham was negotiating with God, it had, it had three people, two of them were angels, the other people believe is an incarnation or a manifestation of God. And so if no one's seen the father, then uh, I, I suspect that that incarnation has to be the son. That manifestation, I mean. Okay, now you know the difference between the terms theophany and Christophany. And you understand why I conclude that <clears throat> there must only be Christophanies, no theophanies. Yeah, I understand, especially like in the context of this verse. Because then it would be, because when you think about all these examples of, you know, God manifesting himself, and if no man has seen the Father, then you'd have to cross out all of those examples, because then those would be examples. If it was the Father that came, you would, that would be, okay, then that means that this verse is wrong, because that means the Father had shown himself all those times. So, you know, supporting you know, the pre-incarnate Christ. I've heard that term, you know, tons of times before. I've just never heard it in the, using the two terms that you've explained it. But, yeah, that's about all I have on this so far. Yeah. And then we, we also have the verse that says, no man has seen God. Um, and uh, you cannot see God and live. Well, everybody saw Jesus Christ and they lived. Uh, so could you conclude that Jesus is not God? No. Uh, they saw the, the humanity of Jesus, not that, see, he has two natures, divine nature and human nature. They saw the, the, the human nature, uh, the, the man, Jesus, the son of man. Not the, and so, um, uh, but when, <clears throat> uh, when it says uh, no one can see God and live, I take that to mean no one can see God in his full glory as he real truly is. It'd be like looking into the sun. I mean, you can't, they, you're always told, don't stare into the sun. You can look up and see the sun, but you cannot stare into the sun. It'll, you'll go blind. If, if you were, if you're able to actually see God in his full glory, then you would die. Just like God said to Moses on, on the mountain. He says, uh, don't look back. You, uh, you can see my hind side, but you can't see my face. If you look at my face, you'll die. <laughs> so uh, anything to say to say about that before we move on? Yeah, I do like that illustration about looking into the sun, how it will blind you. But of course, you know, as I've said before, that, you know, the, the sun is just one of God's creations. And there's nothing that 
you know, the creator is always greater than anything he's created. So just the magnitude of God is just so much you know, more powerful than anything the sun or any of the stars of the moon could ever be. So just being able, like, nothing could take that, literally. At least not in my opinion. Well, actually, it even says it right here. It's not just about my opinion. All right, let's continue on. Uh, let me see. It's uh, uh, It was verse... Uh, Oh, I just noticed on verse 42, uh, remember I said in a previous study, it also made this point. Let me read that again for your benefit here. It says, uh, backing up a few verses from where we started today, because I remember from the last study that we covered this, and they said, is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, who whose father and mother we know? How is it then that he saith, I came down from heaven? Oh, well, no, I think I have to go back farther, farther. Uh, well, I don't want to rehash that previous study, but there is a, a verse there that says, um, no one uh, has, uh, well, that verse here says, no one's been to heaven except him that's come down from heaven. Uh, <clears throat> this is, now we'll go to verse uh, 47 in the KJV. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. Uh, well, I, I don't, before I read in the KJV, let me get your response to that. In my opinion, I mean, this is the most straightforward, you know, salvation verse. Well, at least one of them to me as possible. You know, as Jesus says it, you know, plainly right here, he that believeth on me, you know, hath everlasting life. But, of course, when he says believe upon me, it's not just about, you know, believing that, you know, he was there because these people can see him. I mean, they obviously know he's there and they know he exists. But it's about, you know, putting your faith in him and putting like your trust in him alone and not yourself and not in any other belief or anything else. But just on him alone, because, you know, Jesus paid it all. You know, it's, well, I won't get into the verses yet, but. You know, Jesus, you know, laid down the only sacrifice that's acceptable because, you know, we can't do anything because we're sinful. But Jesus being perfect, you know, and being fully God came down here in the flesh and died for us. And, you know, and this is all he asks of us is that we believe on him and that we just put our trust in him, you know, and not in ourselves. And this is just a very straightforward verse, in my opinion. Um, there's uh, some people I know that have been arguing particularly with me, just making the point that um, I am guilty of uh, teaching single verse salvation. And I guess uh, I have to confess, I, I, I do believe in single verse salvation. Um, I have a playlist titled uh, Faith in Jesus, Not in Knowledge. And the whole point of all those videos is to defend the position that um, we can get saved from a single verse. We don't need um, two, three, four, five, six verses to cover all the bases. Uh, obviously, uh, if you've been following my videos, you know that not only at the end of every message, we do a very thorough, complete um, uh, salvation message. We tell people who Jesus is and what he's done and, and, and why you need him and, and, and how you get saved. It's very thorough. We cover all the bases. We don't want to be negligent and be lazy and, and uh, just say one verse and be done with it. However, that doesn't mean that if a person doesn't ha have all the information, they don't have all the knowledge. They have not uh, been taught everything that we want to teach them that we think is important, uh, that Maybe there's a person that wasn't uh, fortunate enough to come across uh, Brother Stephen and, and uh, you, you know, who, who was uh, able to, to teach them um, all the facts about who Jesus is and what he did and how to be saved. But all they did was know that heard this one verse here and they believed it. Can they be saved from this one verse? I'll read it one more time. And it says, um, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. Now, are you are you of the 
not you, uh, brother, but uh, whoever's watching this video, are you under the um, impression that a person has to understand all the facts about Jesus before they can be saved? Uh, well, this verse here would would dispute that. It says, if you simply believe on him, you have everlasting life. I'm going to read it in the Amplified because it, it amplifies it, as I said, and does a good job on this verse. It says, I assure you and most solemnly say to you, he who believes in me as Savior, who adheres to, trusts in, relies on, and has faith in me, already has eternal life. That is, now possesses it. <laughs> that really expounds on it just perfectly, I think, that uh, what believing in him is, believing is in, in him is trusting in him, relying on him. Uh, believing on him means you're depending on him. You're relying on him to save you. And, uh, and it says half everlasting life. That means you already have it. The moment you've believed on him, the moment you said, I'm depending completely on Jesus, then you already have eternal life at that point. And because it's eternal life, it can never be lost or taken away. Otherwise, it wouldn't have been eternal life. So um, if uh, you're someone that thinks that this here, give me, I'll give you an example. Uh, I don't know anybody that is just simply going to say a single verse like this to someone and let it go. Uh, I don't really know anybody. Anybody who really cares about uh, spreading the gospel, they're not going to read John 6, 47, recite it, and then walk away and never talk to them again. You know, uh, people who uh, understand salvation and love Jesus and that love the lost and want to tell them the good news, they're going to tell them the facts that, that uh, they need to know too. However, if a, a person wasn't fortunate enough to learn all the facts, but simply, as the scripture says, called on the name of the Lord. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, the name of the Lord is Jesus, and if someone simply says, Jesus, save me, and they believe that Jesus is the one that can save them, and they, they, they think they're lost and they need to be saved, then I believe that's a, the verse is true. Otherwise, you'd have to say the scripture's not true. All right, brother, well, what's your comment on all that? And the greatest part is, you know, that, you know, God will never lie to us. And, you know, his word does not lie. You know, it's infallible. But, like, I just love it, you know, how it says you have everlasting life. You know, as in you already possess it. And, of course, it says everlasting life, not temporary life. And, you know, not, you know, something that's just going to fade away. It's you have everlasting life just for trusting on him. And, you know, and the sacrifice that he made for you, that, you know, he's your savior. I mean, savior, it's nothing else. You can't work your way to him. You know, being, you know, no matter how, like, what good works you do, no matter how, quote, unquote, obedient you think you are, or no matter, you know, what you believe in, it's only by trusting in Jesus, you know, can one be saved. No, I'm not speaking against any good works or against obedience, but it's just about where your faith, you know, really lies. Yeah, but it says, whosoever believeth on him, if, if you believe on Jesus, are you believing on, on your ability to practice a religion? It, mm, that's a good question. But like, the thing is, it's like, the key is, it's just, is trusting in Jesus alone and not trusting in, you know, yourself and, you know, and what you do. Because if you're trusting in what you do, it's not going to be enough. It never will be because you're just going to fall short. I did. You said it was a very good question. I didn't think it was a good question at all. I was asking the question. I, I hope you'd say, well, obviously no, because uh, you cannot believe on Jesus and, and, and then believe that you're going to get to heaven through practicing religion and doing good works. You can't believe that. They're, they, uh, they contradict each other. They nullify each other, as, as the Apostle Paul said, uh, uh, grace and works together nullify each other. They frustrate each other. Uh, so if, if a person takes this verse and really understands believing on Jesus means you're believing on him and nobody else, nothing else. You're not believing in yourself. You're not believing in uh, your priests. You're not believing in your, your uh, good works. You're believe if you believe on him, that means you're not believing on the other things. You're believing on him. 
All right, let me go on. Okay, verse... Uh, Okay, verse 48, I am that bread of life. Uh, see, earlier in the chapter, that was part of the discussion about the bread of life. From the, He says, your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which cometh down from heaven that a man may eat thereof and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Well, I'll read one more verse. The Jews therefore strove among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? <laughs> okay, brother, I get, I'll, I'm going to pass the ball over to you. <laughs> well, I mean... A lot of these Jews and a lot of people took things way too literally, as a lot of people sometimes will do. You know, as Jesus himself has said, you know, he who has eyes to see and ears to hear, let them see and hear, you know, in this situation. But, you know, but you remember he said that um, looking back to verse 32, my father giveth you the, the true bread from heaven. And, of course, Jesus is confirming that, you know, he is that bread. Now, he alludes right here back to the you know, the manna in the wilderness and are dead because he's talking about kind of dispelling it, I guess, because like this is literal bread that, you know, that people were physically eating. You know, they ate that, you know, but it's not going to save their eternity. You know, that was just for them to get by, you know, at that time. But, you know, Jesus is the true bread, which wells up forever because, you know, by believing on him alone, you know, you have salvation you know, that goes forever because, you know, it talks about, his, you know, because Jesus, no, it says right here in verse, you know, 50, you know, he comes down from heaven and it says, if any man may eat thereof, you know, and not die. Well, when I think of eat, it's, you know, you know, it's, I think I consume like where it's entering in, like in a way, that's how I'm thinking, because it's like you get, you know, immersed in Jesus. I mean, when, you know, you believed on him, you know, as we call it, you know, you know, the baptism. I remember we've talked about that in, you know, previous videos, but when he talks about, you know, his flesh, you know, he's talking about, you know, he sacrificed himself in the flesh. You know, he came down here to earth and was cru and had his flesh crucified, you know, so that way we would believe on him and have everlasting life, you know, just for believing on him. You know, and, and the gospel is just, you know, that simple because, you know, he comes down from heaven when he doesn't have to and he pays the price, you know, that we deserve. And only just that way we can have everlasting life, you know, with him. I want to hear your comments on this. Well, let me react to your comment. You, uh, what you've done is you, you've spiritualized it. And uh, then uh, and some other people would say we shouldn't spiritualize it. This, should, this is literal. And there's about 1.2 billion people in the world today who are called Roman Catholics, that they, they think that you're wrong for spiritualizing it, that this is literal. And you think that the, uh, the bread later on, which gonna, we're going to, th this can also be a reference to the Last Supper, where he does the same thing. He references uh, this, this bread represents, is his flesh. He, he didn't say represents. He said, this, is, this bread is my flesh. This drink is my blood. And so the Roman Catholics, they take that literally and they believe in a, a fancy con term called transubstantiation. If trans means to change, substance is the substance. Uh, the, the bread is no longer literally bread. It literally changes into the substance of Jesus' flesh. Now, this is a, not a, just a new modern idea. I saw this into the arguments of the, in church history in the first few centuries. This concept started entering in, and this is uh, there's factions of people who are who fought in actually wars and persecution. Thousands and probably hundreds of thousands of people were killed if they if they did not uh, agree that this is a literal change of substance that it literally is his flesh and blood. So you, throughout some much of church history, 
if you expressed it the way you did, uh, that would be grounds for them to kill you. And then, of course, by killing you, they had the right to take all your property, too. Uh, but this is uh, uh, the, the, the idea that this bread of life, Jesus is the bread of life, and that his, eating his flesh is literal. It, it's just like in Nicodemus, uh, taking literally that you must be born again. He said, Do I have to go? How can I go back into my mother's womb? Uh, how, uh, when the woman at the well said, uh, This reference the living water and and uh, Jesus said that she doesn't understand uh, understand it uh, because she was taking it literally rather than spiritually and it's the same thing with this verse here about the, the bread of life we are not supposed to take that literally anybody who does I think is superstitious and and either insane or just brainwashed uh, I, I think it's pretty clear that uh, uh, it doesn't change substance. Now, they could argue that the substance, if you put it under a microscope and dissect it and stuff, you'll see it, it still really is bread. But what we cannot see is the real essence of it underneath, underneath it all, is his flesh. So they say it's literally his flesh, but it's the essence. It changes in essence, and it's, uh, uh, it's unseen. So this has uh, been pretty amazing to me as I've studied this uh, problem. And it's not just a, a, a common problem today of 1.2 billion Roman Catholics, but throughout church history, this has been a problem, the way people have been taking the, these verses here. Let me ask you your opinion on all that. I like that you brought up the, you know, Catholics and, you know, taking it literally, because a lot of them do take the... Um, have a very wrong idea about the Eucharist saying that, you know, that they have to, t I mean, I'm not hundred percent, you know, probably right on this, but, you know, believing that, you know, they have to do this to like maintain their salvation or something like that. But the thing is they're trusting in this physical bread they're eating and in you know the wine or whatever they're drinking, you know, for their salvation, they're not trust. They're like, they're tr like, it's what we were talking about actually in the, um, the last set of verses actually. They're trusting in their own practices to save them, you know, and on their church to save them, and you know, and that this meal to save them instead of you know trusting on what Jesus did on the cross, and that's a really big problem. Yeah. All right. Uh, so let's go on. Yeah. So uh, let me read that in the Amplified. See how it writes it. Let me see. That's verse forty-eight. I'll start there. Verse forty-eight. And the Amplified is, I am the bread of life, the living bread which gives and sustains life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread that comes down out of heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down out of heaven. If anyone eats this bread, that is, believes in me, accepts me as Savior, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh, my body. Then the Jews began to argue with one another, saying, how could this man give us his flesh to eat? <laughs> so you can see, I think that did a good job of uh, explaining. the. Uh, they, they, in their translation, they spiritualized it as we do. It says that... Uh, um, let me see, how do, how do they phrase it again? It says, um, uh, if anyone eats this bread, that is, believes in me, accepts me as Savior. So they're interpreting it as when you, eating this bread of life is just simply believing in Jesus. It's not even a ritual or a ceremonial thing where you eat the communion as a ceremony and, and to do it in remembrance of him. It's, it's just the idea is it's like drinking living water. Do you have to drink living water to be saved? No, he did it as an, as an illustration of how easy it is that just if you, it's easy. All you got to do is drink the water. And that is you, you believe, you believe in him. So, um, uh, I, I like how they, they inserted that as eating the bread means to believe in him. But this is the thing that is interesting, the Jews' reaction. He said, then the Jews began to argue with one another, saying, how could this man give us his flesh to eat? 
What do you think of that reaction? You know, just as we talked about, like with, you know, Lazarus and, you know, like the woman and other people, you know, looking at, you know, verse <coughs> uh, 52, it's like, just like, you know, with the, like some of these Catholics, they're just taking it like way too literally in a sense. Like they're just trying, like, they're baffled. I guess at the time they just didn't have, you know, the eyes to really see what's going on here. But that's the comment I have so far for verse 52. Okay. All right. Let me go back now to the KJV. Uh, then this is Jesus' answer. They said to him, the Jews therefore strove among themselves saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? Then Jesus said to them, verily, verily, I say unto you, except ye eat the flesh of the son of man and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood, hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him. As the living Father hath sent me, and I live by the Father, so he that eateth me, even shall he shall live by me. Um, uh, let me uh, stop there and see, get your reaction to all that. Yeah, looking at verses 53 and 54, those are probably verses that some people might do, you know, take actually literally like, you know, the Catholics, you know, thinking that they have to keep, you know, partaking in like the communion. So like some people just might take that literally and then end up believing in that, which can which is also, as I said, it's just really a problem, like in that situation. But of course, you know, it says you know, the flesh is meat indeed and, and drink indeed. Well, I mean, believing in him obviously is just the essence. Like it, you know, believe, you know, having him, you know, could, would you receive him by believing on him? You know, it's the essence you get that lasts for eternity. I mean, you have everlasting life, you know, in Jesus. But, you know, as I was just saying, like these first two verses can like some people definitely might take them, you know, literally. And of course he says, he talks about his father a little bit too, but I want to get your comments on this. Well, my impression of that, those verses I just read uh, is that Jesus, he, uh, he went even further and further and further making it seem so outrageous that uh, we know what happened. Uh, coming up, I think, is the verse is going to say that uh, many of the people left him. They stopped following him because they thought he was crazy or cannibal or something, you know, believe in cannibalism. But So my question back to you is, why do you think that he would not just state it in a, in a vague way, but he gets really specific as he did in these last few verses. And he, he makes it pretty much impossible for them to, uh, for many of them to um, accept it. They, they were repelled by it, by the whole thought of it. Why would he do that? To me, it's a, um, looking at like, why would he like repel them? I guess it's just, it's well to me it's just showing the significance you know of you know believing them but i guess it's really just kind of pushing back like maybe if they're literalist you know view you know instead of just being able to you know see it you know like you know the spiritual way you know and just believe on him but then again that's because it goes against a lot of like a lot of the like beliefs in the situation because as he said you know it's he who hath eyes to see and ears to hear in the situation like what do you have to say well, let me ask the same question another way uh, to you, and that is, uh, he spoke in parables, and uh, people kept getting confused, and his apostle says, why do you keep talking in parables? People are getting confused. And do you remember what his answer was? Didn't he say it wasn't given unto them to understand that stuff? He, it, the, the, that particular point if i'm going i'm not going to be able to quote it off my top of my head but the point he's making there is that 
if he spoke plainly, everybody would underst understand it. And uh, but but he said he's speaking in parables so that only the people who had the true, the right heart, the right eyes, the right ears, the the uh, the right spirit, they would see, be able to understand and see through the parable and get the hidden meaning. Because a parable is a story that has a secondary meaning that's spiritual. And so he spoke that way to kind of separate the, the people who had the right attitude. These are the people who were really desiring him and to be a savior and versus the other people that they just wanted to be fed. They just wanted miracles. They wanted healings. And they just wanted a, a, a king to, to defeat Rome. But the people who truly understood, hey, this is the Savior to give us eternal life in heaven, that's a spiritual concept. And he also said that the, uh, the kingdom of God is not neither here nor there, low here or low there. He said the kingdom of God is within. It's spiritual. So uh, all the things he's been really teaching about is spiritual ideas. And, and uh, only the people who had spiritual eyes we're going to be able to understand it. And I think this is another example. He makes it so bloody and gory and cannibalistic. And it basically, it kind of weeds out the, the people. So the people will leave who are, who don't have spiritual eyes. Uh, let me read it all in the Amplify and see how it sounds there. Uh, He said, then the Jews began to argue with one another, saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? And Jesus said to them, I assure you and most solemnly say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the son of man and drink his blood, that is, unless you believe in me as savior and believe in the saving power of my blood, which will be shed for you, you do not have life in yourselves. The one who eats my flesh and drinks my blood, that is, believes in me, accepts me as Savior, has eternal life, that is, now possesses it, and I will raise him up from the dead on the last day. For my flesh is the true spiritual food, and my blood is true spiritual drink. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood believes in me, accepts me as Savior, remains in me, and I, and I in the same way, remain in him. Uh... Just, did, did I get to verse 57? What verse? Just as the living Father sent me and I live because... Okay, no, I, I think 57 is where we'll pick up. Okay, so now, now that you've heard it in the Amplified and you've heard my opinion about why he's speaking this way, um, do you have an, any opinion? Honestly, at this point... I don't actually have too much to say as of right now. Okay, I'll continue on in the KJV now. Verse 57. As the living Father hath sent me, and I live by the Father, so he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. This is, the, this is that bread which came down from heaven. Not as your fathers did eat manna and are dead. He that eateth of this bread shall live forever. These things said he in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. Many, therefore, of his disciples, when they heard, had heard this, said, This is a hard saying. Who can hear it? I'll stop there at verse 60. Well, Looking at, I mean, this is what we were just talking about, is they were t saying, you know, you know, who can hear it? And we were just talking about, you know, people with you know, the right type of spiritual eyes and ears. Of course, I've already said it, as Jesus said, he who had, you know, eyes and ears to see and hear, let them, you know, see and hear. But like, now we actually had read verse 57 earlier, but looking at verse, you know, 58, it's... Actually, I like this. It says, this is the bread which came down from heaven. It says, not as your fathers did eat manna and are dead. Because this is they, not as they ate, you know, literally ate bread. And now they're, now they're dead. And then he says, but he that eateth of this bread shall live forever. As in, you know, he that 
in this sense, eating is believing on him. And you have everyone. I mean, yes, you still have to die physically, but you're going to have everlasting life, you know, forever. And, but yet the first one was talking about, you know, physical bread, you know, that they ate. And so that's probably why I would say it says not as your fathers did eat in this verse. Like, what do you have to say? Okay. Well, I think uh, you're, what you said just right there. I'm going to read it in the Amplified and see how it expresses it. 58 in the Amplified says, This is the bread which came down out of heaven. It is not like the manna that our fathers ate and they eventually died. The one who eats this bread, that is, believes in me, accepts me as Savior, will live forever. He said these things in a synagogue while he was teaching in Capernaum. When many of his disciples heard this, they said, this is a difficult and harsh and offensive statement. Who can, who can be expected to listen to it? Yeah. Okay, I think we've, we've, we have a good understanding of all that. I'm going to go back, back to KJV now in uh, verse uh, 61. When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it, he said unto them, Doth this offend you? What and if ye shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before? It is the Spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. Let, let me leave it there at verse 63. Your reaction to all of that. Yeah, and that really just, you know, sums up what we were just talking about, actually, how he says the words are spirit. You know, they are, you know, life. I actually am glad we were talking about this because now it helps me understand this verse a little bit better. Because it says, you know, the flesh profiteth nothing. So that can be saying, seeing it from the fleshly point of view, from the literal point of view, like, you're not going to understand it and you're not going to get anywhere. But you, like, you need to be able to see it, you know, through the spiritual, you know, point of view as any of you know, believing on him, not physically eating, you know, his, not, you know, like t not walking up to his arm and biting his skin off, but by believing on him. I know like there's probably going to be some Catholics who really throw their hands up at me for this, but Jesus, you know, spelled it out. I feel like pretty, you know, plainly here, even, you know, saying, you know, does this offend you? Like almost like, wow. And of course, it's a big statement saying, what if you'll see the Son of Man ascend up to where he was before? Like, you know, seeing him, I guess, like, you know, in his glory. But, you know, as Jesus said, you know, earlier, like, if you can't comprehend earthly things, how are you going to comprehend anything that's heavenly? Like, it'll be too much for you. So, yeah, but the main thing is definitely being able to see it in the spiritual view to believe on him for salvation instead of just taking it so literally. Yeah, uh, I see the same thing going on here as I did, as I said, with a woman at the well and the conversation with Nicodemus in the garden. And he says these things <coughs> that are, he says it, and it's meant to be taken in a spiritual way. And those people who don't have spiritual eyes, as Jesus said, eyes to see and ears to hear, uh, if their attitude is not right and they can't see the real meaning of what he's saying, uh, then uh, they're not going to get it. And he then he finally even says right here, he even said the same thing to Nicodemus too, uh, when Nicodemus got confused. He, he said, why is it a master, you're one of the teachers of Israel, and you don't understand that the uh, this is not the physically going back to your mother, but it's spiritual. It's a spiritual thing I'm teaching you. It's, it's being born from above, born again spiritually, not physically. Uh, so it's really, uh, uh, I, I, I think the, the answer to the reason he does that is, is the same answer he gave us as to why he spoke in parables. Uh, I'm going to read that section in the Amplified now. It says... Uh, Uh, let me see, verse, uh, what am I on? Verse 61. But Jesus, aware of his disciples, were complaining about it, asked them, does this cause you to stumble and take offense? What then will you think if you see the Son of Man ascending to the realm where he was before? That's an important thing. I mean, what are you going to think when you see me ascending? And he, he will. We know that 
after the resurrection, after 40 days, there's an ascension. They see him just being levitated up to, uh, to space. Um, it says, it is the spirit who gives life, and, and the flesh conveys no benefit. It is no account. Uh, the words I have spoken to you are spirit and life, providing eternal life. Uh, then he says in verse 64, I like this is, but still there are some of you who do not believe and have faith. See, he wants us to trust him. And that's why I, I, I made a video titled uh, Faith, The One Requirement. If you haven't seen it, I hope you'll go watch that video. But uh, I looked at a lot of the faith verses and also the, the uh, dealings with Thomas who doubted the resurrection. And it just, it just seems, my conclusion was that for some reason, God places a great value on us believing without seeing. He said, Thomas, you've, now that you've seen me, you've even touched me, put your finger in my wounds. Now that you've seen me, you believe. But blessed are those who have not seen, and yet they believe. Um, so uh, it says that we walk by faith, not by sight. See, that's what faith really is. Faith is not seeing. If you see, it's not faith. Like uh, Thomas, he didn't have faith. He had knowledge. Uh, he didn't believe. And then after he was able to see Jesus and touch him, he knew it was true. It wasn't a question of believing without seeing. That's what faith is, believing without seeing. So since Thomas got to see him and touch him in the resurrection, it, was, it wasn't a question of faith anymore. It wasn't a question of faith when, when Jesus appeared to Paul on the road to Damascus. He got to see him. Brother, I don't think you've ever saw him and talked to him and touched him. He conversed back with you and, and you know, no, you have faith without seeing. I mean, you have, you believe without seeing, that's faith. And God values that. And he wants us to trust him without seeing him. Um, so that's what I think this is, a, a lot of this is about here. Uh, when he's talking about, um, uh, uh, he said, uh, but still, there are some of you who do not believe and have no faith. I'm going to let me get your reaction to that before I read the final verses here. Yeah, and well, I mean, obviously, it's not of his will that anybody, you know, not believe and have to be go to damnation, but. Yeah, it's just, you know, there's some people who just don't believe and just don't, you know, get what he's saying and just, you know, just won't trust in him. Even though they see him, you know, physically, even though they've been around him, they're just not willing to, you know, trust in him. And, and of course, you know, their entire eternity revolves around that, whether they'll be saved or whether they'll be lost forever. Mm -hmm. There's a... Uh... There's a scene in the, uh, like one of the Raiders of the Lost Ark movies and where he has to take a step of faith. Uh, it's across a canyon. And, and it looks like if you take a step, you'll fall into the canyon and be killed. But as soon as he takes the step, there's a crossing away that he couldn't see, but it was there. And, and so in a way, Jesus is saying, you can cross from over there to over here to be with me. Uh, I want you to trust me. The, trust me, just take a step. I won't let you fall. I, I'll save you. Just take that step and trust me. And that's what, that's what salvation really is, is we, we believe in him, we trust him, we depend on him, even though we cannot see that there's a bridge to walk across. We trust him anyway. Uh, let me read the end of this in the KJV and then we'll close here. It says, um, maybe I better just quit right here. There are some of you that don't believe. Uh, 
60. What and if ye shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before? 63. Sixty-four. Okay, sixty-four. We're going to pick up with sixty-four. Let me see. I'll write this down. John six sixty-four. That's where we'll pick up next time. Um, all right. So for now, um, let me get your just kind of like summary thoughts on the study tonight, and then what? Then after that, we'll we'll go into the invitation. Yeah, what I really like is just the you know, simplicity in which it talks about, especially in John six forty seven. You know, that he that believeth on me hath everlasting life, and how it refers to himself, you know, as the bread of life, that he who believes on him, no, not literally eats him, you know, will have, you know, everlasting life. You know, it's just talking about the importance of being able to see, you know, having eyes to see and ears to hear, you know, to be able to understand it spiritually, to know that it's about, you know, believing on Jesus and having faith in him. And not just, you know, your own religion or just any practice, any deed or any other thing. You know, that's, of course, the importance of the gospel is that it's all about Jesus and what he's done for us. And that for us to have faith in him. As he said, you know, the work of God is to believe on him which he hath sent. You know, not do anything else. Not, like, not trust in your own works or anything else. Not believe in your works or anything. You know, that's the importance, you know, of the gospel. Yeah, when, when I uh, I read it in the KJV, and then when I read it in the Amplified, you, you may have noticed that the Amplified translated eating and drinking as believing and trusting in Jesus as your Savior. And so I think that Jesus talked about uh, he's the door. Uh, how hard is it to open and walk through a door? He's uh, living water. How hard is it for me to just... Yes, that's easy. That's simple. How hard is it to eat a piece of bread? These are just examples of say it's 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 not hard to get saved. Just trust me as your savior, and it's just as just as easy as just taking a drink of water. That's all that I'm requiring of you is just to trust me. So, uh, all right. Well, that'll conclude the the study of um, this portion of John. But now we want to talk about the good news. Uh, we'll take a few minutes now to tell anybody who's not familiar with this what biblical Christianity is. Not the kind of Christianity you find in most churches in America, most churches around the world. Uh, if, you, if you go to those churches, they're going to tell you, if you want to go to heaven, you got to change your life. you got to repent of your sins. you got to turn over a new leaf. You got to get baptized, and then you got to keep your fingers crossed, hoping it's enough. Uh, but that's not what the Bible says. The Christianity that we find in the Bible it tells us what Jesus says here. That it's it's simple, it's easy, it's it's a uh, it's a uh, spiritual. The spiritual uh, answer is it's as easy as drinking and eating and believing, believing in Jesus. So the gospel, which uh, is just a great word that means good news, the good news, if I was going to simplify it down to the most simplest statement, the good news is that Jesus offers you salvation and eternal life in heaven as a free gift. Now, brother, I'll let you take it from there. All right. My favorite part of every one. All right. Well, I know Brother Lucas just put up his uh, profile picture, which I'm sure he'll keep up and he'll explain that to you a little bit more. But I'll start off by you know reading my you know my favorite verse, which talks about the gospel in a nutshell. John three sixteen, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. You see, God had so much love for us that he sent. You know, his only son, Jesus, the son of God, who is the eternal God, came here in the flesh to pay for our sins. He died, was buried, and rose again for us. Now, why did he do that? He did that because, first of all, we can't pay for our sins on our own. For as it says in Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. 
as it says in Romans 3.10, as it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. And I think that says it pretty clearly. No one is good enough, and no one can pay for their salvation on their own by their works or by any method that they try, because we're all going to fall short, and none of us are righteous. As it says in Romans 6.23, the first half, for the wages of sin is death. And that's something that we all deserve. You know, we're sinners, as it said, and we've come short of the glory of God. And it says the wages of sin is death. Now, compared to, you know, the almighty God, no matter how good we are, we're still nothing. We're always going to fall short. And wages are something you earn. So that death is what we deserve. And it says it pretty simple. But the good news is found in the second half of that verse. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord, because Jesus came and paid it all. And a gift is not something you work for. It's something that's freely given to you, which is what Jesus does. He's stretching his hand out right now to every single you know, person offering the gift of everlasting life to them. And all you have to do is believe on him to be saved because Jesus paid the price. He came here in the form of a man in the flesh. He was perfect. He was sinless. He pleased his father. He did everything that we couldn't do. But the most important thing is, besides all the miracles he performed, I'm going to just put up my profile picture for a minute. You see this cross here. Now, it's not about the actual wooden structure, but it's about who was on that structure. Jesus died the most painful death imaginable. He shed his blood for us. He was buried, and then three days later, he proved who he was because he rose again, proving that he had the power to take life back. And, But when he died, he put all of our sins on him. He took away you know, all of our sins. And all, like, by dying, he did what he didn't have to do. He came here and died for us. And all he said we have to do is believe. As it said, you know, tonight in John 6, 47, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, you know, hath everlasting life. That's all we have to do. And just to verify what I have said, Jesus said in John 14, you know, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man will come to the Father but by me. There's no other way. Just verifying what I said, like, there, you cannot save yourself in any way. Not only do you fall short, but Jesus paid it all. And it's the only way, and it's the only sacrifice that's acceptable. But, you know, more good news, though, on this is the fact that not only are you saved, but you're saved forever. As it says in John 10, 28, and I give it, this is Jesus speaking, and I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish and neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. And he's talking about those who believe on him, you know, those who trust in him. And you can have that blessed assurance too. You know, every person listening here who hasn't, you know, come to Jesus already. Jesus paid the price for you. You know, he did what you couldn't do and he came and he died for you. He was buried, you know, and he rose again for you. And all he's asking you to do is to have faith in him and, you know, to trust in him. Like, so it's not about trusting, you know, in your own works. You know, as Brother Luke said, a lot of churches will teach that. It's about, like, you doing all these things and then crossing your fingers and hoping that, that that's enough. But that's not going to work. Only by trusting in Jesus can you be saved and in him alone because only he can do it. He paid it all. So that's the invitation I have for you tonight. Come to Jesus and believe on him and live. And that's all I have. Okay. The uh, point we want to make sure you is clear is that you we're not asking you to join a religion or become a religious person or follow some set of religious rules. We're asking you to trust a person. It just so happens that this person happens to be uh, our eternal God Almighty who became a man named Jesus Christ. And so that's the person we're asking you to trust, uh, our great Savior God, Jesus. Um, all right. Thank you for watching. I hope you will join us nightly 7 p.m. Uh, Pacific time for these broadcasts. Bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus Christ.